Hello, good evening and welcome to The Majority Show. Uh, my name is Mark Devlin. I'm the host for you tonight on Scotland's number one politics show, particularly from an anti-nationalist perspective, going out live every Wednesday at 7pm on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook. Um, I'm here tonight with my co-hosts uh, David Griffiths and Mary Devlin. Um, how are you both tonight? I'm doing great, thank you. Hi guys, all good here, thank you. Right, and what are you going to be talking about, uh, Mary? Well, tonight I'll be giving a roundup of just some of the crazy stuff that goes on in one week in Scotland. Wow. Okay, David, what have you got for us? Well, I'll be asking if the UK is about to have its fourth Prime Minister in one parliamentary <laughs> term, and if so, okay. what will be the impact on Scotland? Right, okay. And uh, I'll be discuss leading the discussion on Slickett Sturgeon's WhatsApp shenanigans, plus uh, an extra section on d disillusioned nationalists. And, of course, we will also have Zoomer of the Week. So we'll be back with all that and much more in just a few seconds. Right, welcome back. That scooter clip, oh, it's, it's so ridiculous, isn't it? You see it there. <laughs> Humza Yusuf can't even go a scooter. How can we be expected to lead a country? It's, it never gets old, that one. It does not get old. <laughs> anyway, welcome back to the Majority Show, uh, Scotland's number one politics and chat. Our aim is a thriving Scotland without the toxic nationalism that has infected um, Scotland's potential. I am here tonight with David and Mary, and we're looking forward to a great show. Always, As always, huge thanks to our friends at UK Union Voice and United Against Separation, where many of you are watching tonight. Those are Facebook pages. If you can to support them, please do so. And remember, sharing is caring. The number one thing you can do is to like the show on YouTube, and even if you don't subscribe, just give us a like. And if you can subscribe, of course, please do so to increase the reach of the show at the click of one button. Yes, very good. Um, and, of course, please have a look in the Majority, sh 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 the majority Show shop. shop. The Majority <laughs> Shop. Um, lots of nice goodies in there. Another way you can support the show with T-shirts, mouse mats, mugs, reasonable prices. And whatever you buy, um, sends a message and also uh, helps to support the show. For example, this fantastic... Uh, and you can we love this one here. This is the You're My Favourite Zoomer t-shirt. Definitely that is one for um, posterity, as it were. Remember, we did those reside Sturgeon t-shirts, all gone now. But now those people who have got them are like, wow, this is amazing. I was part of something. Anyway. And I'll be dealing with all your comments tonight, as usual. So please keep them short and snappy. And I'll try to get as many up on screen as I can. Right, okay, much to discuss today, so we'll be back in just a second with all the news. Okay, so some of you may have noticed that this is our 99th show. Next week will be the 100th show in the majority show. It's quite amazing that we managed to get this far. Thank you, everyone who is watching, and as David said, please subscribe to the show. Right, so we're going to talk, first of all, about uh, big news of the week. Sturgeon deleting her WhatsApp messages in the COVID inquiry. The inquiry itself is taking place in Edinburgh and um, is questioning the decisions of the Scottish government during the COVID pandemic, which was led, uh, the Scottish government at that time, was led by St Nicola. Um, she's finally getting some scrutiny. Well, it might be the case if uh, her St Linus of Dreghorn hadn't deleted all of her WhatsApp messages. The UK government had, um, this happened just after, uh, the UK government had told uh, uh, all the devolved governments that they were going to be an inquiry and they had to keep the messages. But um, they said for material or potential re relevance to be kept and not destroyed. Now, perhaps Sturgeon might say what is relevant and what is not. But in um, a typical example of her being just too good to keep records uh, about the life, and uh, you know, she didn't keep them, right? So... It's not as though, though we're talking about the amazing success in dealing with COVID uh, compared with countries um, with the same population. Scotland had many, many times the deaths and uh, questions have to be asked about the policy of putting patients 
in, uh, from hospitals who were COVID positive into care homes where, the, where most of the deaths were. So, <coughs> excuse me, Sturgeon uh, admitted to deleting the messages but said they'd been recovered from other devices and that decision making was not done on WhatsApp. To be clear, they always say to be clear, but why do they say that? It's like, just, you don't need to say that, just write your words. Anyway, I conducted the COVID response through formal processes from my, St. And from my office in St Andrew's house, not from WhatsApp or any informal messaging platforms. Throughout the entire process, I acted in line with the Scottish Government policy. And uh, further to that, Leslie Fraser, Director General Corporate at the Scottish Government, said some messages were simply banter and others may have been lost when phones are upgraded. David, what do you think about all this nonsense? Well, I mean, frankly, uh, to see, uh, I, I kept uh, my uh, use of messages in line with Scottish Government guidelines while I was deleting them all. I mean, that to me is just... <laughs> Right. Didn't she write the guidelines? Absolutely right. I mean, <laughs> farcical this. And this is a woman who stood up, sneered that, um, what's his name, the guy from oh, Kieran Jenkins, saying, of course, even if I could delete them, which I, just to make it clear, I won't, I would never do such a thing just before she went on to yeah, do it. Okay, we'll show that clip in a little, a little bit. Cool. Mm. Okay. So, guys, I mean, you can't have this. You've got somebody up there who's blatantly sneering at the entire population of the UK saying, <laughs> don't you dare question me. Of course I deleted them, but here they are anyway. How do we know that's what they all, they all are? How do we know that Leslie Fraser is right saying they're simply banter? I've got an idea. Why don't you just present them all and then other people will decide. Well, like, I mean, uh, here's a, a thing. I mean, what about when Boris um, said, let the bodies pile up? Was, yeah. that, was that banter right. or was that... Um, you know, an actual statement of policy, right? Was that exactly? Was that a, right, a, exactly? It's up for the public to decide and get the context absolutely. of what the things were. He might be saying, I "Have a joke." Yeah, I was listening to this song the other day. It was called "Let the Bodies Pile Up." You know, for example, I'm just saying, an extreme case. That may not be the case, but like, it could be. And the whole point, as you say, um, David, there is that you need to the, you need to see it has to be taken. The messages have to be taken away from. The people who are make, take, making the messages, the message, yeah. what's it, the analysis of the messages and the and the the what's the retrieve, not retrieval, the opposite retrieval, the storage of the messages has to be right. taken away from the people who are um, uh, involved in these decisions because exactly. otherwise they'll just do, do you know, um, they will they will delete them and this is another weird thing as well. This bit, Fraser woman, she said. Um, that uh, they were they were lost when phones were upgraded. I mean, what I've seen this so many times. If you're using WhatsApp and you get a new phone, you just open your account again and a new it's phone. It's the all same the WhatsApp phone. account. You don't get a new account when you get a new phone. Exactly. Yes. And I, I actually said this incorrectly the other week. In my in previous experiences where I when I upgraded phones, it didn't automatically bring all the old WhatsApp messages across. Well, I upgraded my phone about three weeks ago, and guess what? All the WhatsApp messages came across, even the old ones. It's yeah. not an answer, guys. And in any right. event, they're all uh, server-based anyway. The app is, is, is you can get it, retrieve all the messages in WhatsApp unless somebody uh, dutifully goes through and deletes every one of them for everyone, which I don't think you can do. So and it's just ridiculous. It's, yeah. like you say, if, you, if you've got an inquiry to go through uh, a series of communications and to provide judgment on them, you don't, ahead of that inquiry, choose to delete them all of your own volition because that negates the whole purpose of the inquiry and unlike i've got to say this guys i watched scotland tonight last night and it was Connor matchett and a, a health journalist called penny taylor guys if you haven't seen it please do i have never seen such a bizarre defense of any public figure as penny taylor uh, unleashed in the world in defense of jason leach last night maniacal is the word I would use. And she said, of course, the purpose of this inquiry is to learn lessons in case we have another pandemic. No, it's not. It's to look into the conduct of the people who were involved in Scotland's COVID battle, including Jason Leach and everybody else who was yeah, uh, leading in that. Yeah. It's not to learn lessons at all. Rubbish. So um, honestly, this is not just some box ticking exercise to say, ah, lessons learned. We'll know next time, don't oh, you? Oh, no, it really isn't. It really, <laughs> it really isn't. And of course, it all flies in the face of what Sturgeon had previously said about having the most uh, open and transparent administration ever. When questioned by <laughs> Kieran Jenkins in August 21, um, this is what she said here. Let's see if this comes up. The uh, Scottish Government has a patchy record of disclosing evidence when asked to do so. Can you guarantee to the bereaved families that you will 
disclose emails, WhatsApps, private emails, if you've been using them, whatever, that nothing will be off limits in this inquiry. I think if you understand uh, statutory public inquiries, you would know that even if I wasn't prepared to give that assurance, which for the avoidance of doubt I am, uh, then I wouldn't have the ability. This will be a judge-led statutory uh, public inquiry. Um, I think it's also fair to say, um, you know, I would say it as the First Minister of the Scottish Government, but, you know, it's also fact. We're further ahead than any other government in the UK right now in not just committing to a public inquiry, but actually getting it into operation. Um, you know, people will judge the public inquiry as it progresses and it will be entirely down to the, the judge appointed to lead it as to, to how it goes about its business. But um, as the leader of a government over these past 18 months, um, and I mean this really, really, really strongly, um, I desperately want every appropriate lesson from what we've gone through to be learned so that any future government, hopefully not for decades to come, but any future government that is in a similar situation has the benefit of that learning. Um, and, you know, journalists' job is to be sceptical and questioning about uh, the intentions of government uh, in this regard, in all regards, in fact, but uh, our commitment to this, I think, demonstrated by the speed at which we are moving ahead of others to establish a public inquiry should not be in any... What a load! What a load of guff! I mean, really, what a load of guff! Uh, Kieran later said that you had a sense at that time this would be essentially of paramount importance. I believe I asked this in the day the inquiry timing was announced. I mean, there's so many clips of them being. Um, uh, her saying we're going to be open and transparent. I mean, what is that there? Let me be clear, usual thing, and then the word salad, all the usual nonsense, uh, and so on. And then, of course, when it actually comes down to the crunch, nothing. I was going to say F all, but uh, yeah, F all. Basically, nothing at all. Nothing comes out. So much for your big words, Nicola. That, well, there's no words. That's right. Big words take the place of no words. I don't know. It doesn't sound quite right. But that's that. Do they think we. It's, what do you think of this, David? This, this to part me, of it. What, what you saw there was blatant, outrageous lies, frankly, from Sturgeon. And what I would say is I think this entire process is methodically and very definitely trashing what's left of a reputation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We've seen all these people saying, oh, Nicola Sturgeon helped me through the pandemic. She came out with clear communication and also Jason Leach dead in terms of he didn't speak like a civil servant. Well, how are those people feeling right now when they're watching this stuff? But you heard a little uh, a segment of it there, which he said, of course, the important thing is that we're doing it better than anybody else in the UK. What? This has got nothing to do with it. This is about saving lives. It's not about saying, ha ha, we're better than England or Wales. Honestly, I, I think what's really being seen now is what motivated these people throughout the campaign, and it certainly wasn't uh, the sanctity of Scotland's uh, lives. It was anything but. It was just like a, what they call a, a peeing contest with other uh, with other administrations in the UK, particularly Westminster. Absolutely dreadful. I think you're seeing the absolute worst of these people, and I don't think they'll recover from this. I certainly don't think Sturgeon's reputation will take this hit and, uh, and will be able to come back. I genuinely don't. So... If nothing else, it's successfully buried this the spectre of Sturgeon as a public figure, I would hope. Well, I mean, it was already on a decline anyway. Some people have said uh, nationalism uh, is on the way out, but uh, um, it's already been in the way out. It's dead. It's dead. We're just seeing the final throws, perhaps, um, of it now. Um, WhatsApp messages also need to be retained for purposes of freedom of information requests. Um, and we've seen also uh, pu public servants, civil servants, and uh, Jason Leach as well, basically saying, uh, trying to flout um, those requirements. So when asked if group messages were available via freedom of information requests, the chief medical officer, uh, Sir Greg or some Smith, I think, maybe, uh, yeah. said that we would oh, delete at the end of every day and the person he was talking to showed thumbs up uh, emoji and another face crying with laughter like it's a big joke to them. They are laughing at us. Then the Professor Jason Leach, Scotland's National Clinical Director, told his colleagues that WhatsApp deletion is a pre-bed ritual and that was less than 24 hours after the UK inquiry was unveiled. Now as a dentist one might expect that his pre-bed ritual would be flossing but <laughs> um, and it seems his pre-bed ritual was actually getting on the thing and saying I'm going to delete everything. Now he said my position, as I have described to you, is that I tried to do today's work today, and if I could assure myself that work had been managed and dealt with, then I deleted the informal messaging. 
that had led to that moment. I don't believe this for I I'm, I I don't believe this for a second. Obviously, decisions were going to be made the, uh, made there, or at least the the discussion of decisions was going to be made there. Like say Sturgeon says, or for example, I've decided this, right? Or it doesn't mean that the decision necessarily is made on on the thing they're going backwards and forwards. But you know, there's all kinds of things that should be should be in there. And again, it goes back to that whole thing: who's what's informal. And yep. what's not was banter, and what's not. Of course, he also said that he lost his phone on a trip to Israel, and he couldn't get the messages recovered. Now, perhaps if if Hamas, well, Hamas could have grabbed his phone and taken down one of those tunnels, and maybe never get it back again. But <laughs> nonetheless, he would still be able to get it back from the server. Now. Yeah, you get it back from the provider, right? Yes, of exactly. course, as we said, right? Even Twitter, whatever, as you just get back on. If you go into your web app, that retains all of your messages, your web, yeah, no. what's that web? I guarantee it does. So and that's not even the beginning of an excuse. That, that's really uh, it's an insult, to be honest. Right, but more importantly, he advised Hamza Yousaf how to get round face mask rules. And I think this is quite important here. Basically, mm -hmm. he said that partly if you have a drink, in your hand, you wouldn't get arrested. Brilliant! Now, oh, that's great. Now, if that's only the public, medical advice. if only the public had known that at the time, yeah. that would have saved all those people. Remember, I don't you remember that bar in Glasgow yeah. where the police went in and they grabbed everyone and threw them, threw them out and arrested a whole bunch of people. I yep. think it was for dancing. It was for somebody who'd been dancing. Yeah, exactly. Thing with a glass in their hand. Uh -huh. Ah, you see, you know, mm. that's that's the way to do it. Get yeah. them for a bottle, bottle of Corona, whatever you know. What it, a joke! Oh. Honestly. I mean, this is the thing here, but it, also, it brings up the question here a little bit. This, didn't the health minister, Hamza Yousaf, actually know the rules at that point? Well, the, if the, the, the episode of Scotland Tonight I talked about last night went into that in some detail, and Conor Matchett said it seems clear that you would expect the health secretary uh, at the time to know the details of the uh, Scottish government's health policy with relation to COVID. But uh, as we know, uh, Scott, uh, Hamza Yusuf isn't exactly very good on the detail, as Connor pointed out, and he's certainly not. <laughs> this is well, can you imagine that imbecile as health secretary? What an absolute joke. A I mean, really? pandemic. Can you imagine? Seriously, my God. Oh, my. Anyway, yeah. Absolutely. Dave, David, actually, you've met um, Professor Leach, haven't you? I have. It was accidental, but I did meet him. I had a very, very pleasant chat with him. He was very, very genuine, very pleasant, indeed spoke very openly about his time his role and, and the, the some of the difficulties and he was very engaging i actually liked him very much uh, he was very interested in the anti-nationalist viewpoint which i was put, putting forth I had an extremely um convivial chat with him and i watched his testimony yesterday at times it did look a little bit like he was engaging in a you know a battle of wits courtroom battle of wits with a question but like, some of the stuff he said was like uh, i don't accept your interpretation of the guidance and it's a hypothetical question with which i disagree Frankly, Jason, my friend, you looked a little bit glib. That wasn't your finest hour, I'm very sorry to see. Um, and as for the exchange you've referenced with Hamza Yusuf saying you stand up and hold the drink in your hand, guys, you can't do that. You're leading the, the, the fight against the pandemic here. You're not giving your friends a get out so they can get away with uh, avoiding the, uh, the, the, the very strict guidelines which you're imposing yourselves. You cannot do that. It looked terrible. So genuinely not as proud this moment. He, he, he really should reflect on that, I'm afraid. We yeah. are getting a lot of mic noise here, guys. Can we maybe have a look at our, our mics? David, I thought maybe you were typing something. I was I'm I'm People are saying there's an awful lot of noise. Guys, this is me. I'm so sorry. I, I'm not sure what you can maybe go yeah? off and again if you want. Okay, no, you're fine. I think it's fine at the moment. I think it's just when you're typing or touching the keyboard, there is an issue. You stay now. away from the keyboard. It yeah, might be okay. stay away. Hands off. Sorry, Pause really? off. Sorry, guys. Pause All off. Right. Oh. No, that's no. <laughs> right. They did it again. Right. Okay. Well, anyway, maybe it's a seat thing. I or think it's a like loose that. wire. Well, it's many, whatever. Um, because of all this nonsense, Jackie Bailey called for his resignation. Um, so as well, uh, I mean, what are the actual sanctions that can be taken against? This is the question. You know, is that if you if you think you only delete something when you think that the the punishment for uh, exposing that thing is going to be worse than what you get from delete, less than what you get from uh, expo exposing. Sorry, I got confused there. But you know what I mean, right? If, yeah. Right. If so by exposing it, you'll be uh, more, you'll be subject to greater sanctions. And if you delete it, then you'll delete yes. it. 
exactly right. Right. Yeah. So what are these sanctions? I mean, there's loss of public trust, but that's not our law. I mean, that's a loss to the public, right? But it's not a loss to them, right? The person doing it, they're like prepared to lose lose faith, a face, you know, People go, oh, Sturgeon, you didn't put your emails out. But that's not really a sanction to her, is it? Well, the alternative was obviously worse. Right. And then I saw something about the Inquiries Act 2005. It says it's an incriminal offence. If someone intentionally suppresses, conceals, alters, or destroys a relevant document, offenders face a life of large fine or even prison. But does any of us really think that that or the the talk of a criminal investigation is ever going to go anywhere? No, I, mean, you, I can't see it. I can't see. It. I can't see any resignations either. To be honest, I think they're all just too sure of themselves. Frankly, I, I think they they all feel uh, inured <laughs> from any of the potential uh, sanctions. I don't. I don't think anything will happen. I think this is. I think this is a bit toothless. To be honest, I think that's a great shame. And I think the uh, the bereaved will feel extremely uh, hard cheated. Done. Well, yeah, it cheated is right. And I think they won't forget when it comes to the next election, exactly who's landed them in here. And the, the, the Scottish government, the SNP, is going to have a hell of a job of blaming all this and Boris Johnson and the, the Westminster government because of it. Well, but, I mean, as, as uh, Craig mentioned there in the comments, uh, Boris, and Boris is gone, yep. right? Boris yep. had to resign because of that and some other stuff as well. But, I mean, he was, I mean, be talking about a cake at a party that he barely attended was, was the reason, right? And whether you agree with that or not, the actual mechanics of it are far less than this kind of willful um, deletion of messages. Right. Not, and that's before we even get to her conduct conduct in this case. Now, there's been a lot of discussion. Actually, we'll take a wee break for a second and we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, Devi. Yeah. That's, Devi's going to talk, do that. So uh, back in a second. Right, thank you for joining us tonight on the Majority Show. We hope you get some storms. Okay, that's quite something, all that wind. Almost as much wind as a, an Alex Salmon speech. Uh, so, Evi Shridhar and Zero Covid. Dave, Indeed. got if something you, to say I mean, about that? Yeah, well, my, my initial uh, introduction, if you like, to Devi Shridhar was when she uh, was involved in the discussions about uh, when Scottish school children should go back to school, at, just at the time when they were claiming in Scotland that we were almost free of the, the pandemic, if you remember, and it had pretty much the virus had pretty much been eliminated, and it was only nasty English people bringing it into the country, which led to people standing on the border, hurling insults at passing motorists driving north at Gretna. Debbie Schrader then said, well, my opinion is uh, that uh, as we're seeing the uh, rate of uh, infections dropping, I think it's safe that we could maybe reintroduce children to schools because that's where they need to be, and that's what I think is the right move. So we should look to accelerate that. Two hours later, Nicola Sturgeon came out saying the absolute opposite, that we should slow down the return of children to school because it's important not to get ahead of ourselves. The next morning, 12 hours later, Debbie Schrader came out saying, the First Minister and I are totally aligned in this, and I absolutely agree with her plan to slow down the, re- the return of children to school. So a complete reversal of what she'd said the previous day. I thought, right, you're, you're, you're one to watch, madam, aren't you? And so she was part of this nonsense, Sridhar, where she were more or less saying we would be free of the disease in Scotland if it wasn't for these horrible English people mm-hmm. who have the correct um, precautions and who are subject to the rule of the dreadful Boris Johnson. And if it wasn't for them, there'd be nobody in Scotland with the disease at all. That's pretty yes. much the, 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 uh, the essence of what they were saying. Now, we've also seen people, we still see it now, we see people like Zimbabwe and Maggie Chapman telling us that Scottish pre-teen children, as young as eight, should be able to decide their own sex and start to plan for the, uh, if you like, the mutilation of their own bodies. Now, we all know about Canadian Lorna Slater's contribution to the Scottish political scene and to the Scottish economy over the last few years that she's held a, a government role. My God, what a thought. Anyway, which raises a question, why is it so many foreigners here arrive and become immediately enthralled to the nationalists? If, if, if any of us went to live in America, we wouldn't start dictating policy to Donald Trump. Oh, I went to, we would lived in America. Of course exactly. we would do, do that. I mean, it's not so much the policy. It's actually the main policy of breaking up the country is, is quite objectionable. I mean, I think people can be involved in politics, but when it comes to, to you know, you, you come to a country, you, you be the guest, 
of that country, you take its benefits of it. No, I don't mean actual benefits. I mean the benefits of society. You come here for a reason, right? You don't, you don't, or to any country, country, you go there for a reason. You don't go there to break it up. I mean, who does that? I just think it's, I just think it's really, really very bizarre to do that. But in Scotland's case, I think these people come and they somehow, I think perhaps they either get in with a bad crowd, as it were, or they get in, they get this feeling that to be, be truly Scottish, then they have to, you know, go with Scottish nationalism. When yeah. these people would probably wouldn't be, would be a mile away from nationalism. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you say to Devi Sridhar, well, what do you think about Indian nationalism? Or what do you think about Serbian nationalism? They will, you know, t- you turn up their nose, of course, at that. Then you go, well, wait a minute, aren't you a Scottish nationalist or working for Scottish nationalists? Oh, no, but that's a different kind of nationalism. <laughs> they always come up, right? Yeah, I saw, the, I saw the debate this week you got into it again, Mark. Somebody said it was uh, civic. Nationalism. Well, it's always this, you know, civic. Well, I like to say that, well, civic nationalism makes as much sense as civic racism <laughs> and it's basically the same thing. Yeah, I'm a civic racist. Right? Okay, well, what a whole bunch of nonsense. <laughs> nonsense that is. Totally. Anyway, but uh, yeah, we do see this kind of thing here and it's interesting to see people in the chat ask them a little bit and say, well, why do you think that happens? Um, we see many, many, many people come from out- outside. I had a long, actually, uh, discussion with this guy, Christian Allard, is a, 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 a councillor or is an MSP, I can't remember, in, 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 in Edinburgh. He's from France. And I was like, why have you never actually gone out and um, talked to people around you who are not nationalists and asked them what they think of what you're doing? Yep. And, and, and I don't think they ever have. I don't think they ever go out and say um, to talk to people. You know, why would, and I think, why would you go to a country and immediately put yourself against half of its or more? of its um, inhabitants. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, in fact, with this Devi Sridhar, she has a history then of uh, mocking uh, unionists, it says in here, in this article, deleting tweets that she had. What's this time here? The reassuring daily consistency of unions, bots and trolling, Um, whatever. And then, of course, the famous one, which, which she did here, to Americans wondering what's going on, here's my naive take. Scotland is now doing well in its response to COVID-19. It seems to anger anti-Scottish pro-UK people. Unions who are now turning their attacks on me because I serve in a scientific advisory group on the Scottish government. Anti-Scottish pro-UK people. Who does she think she is? <laughs> it's like, what? That's just the regurgitation of... If you, you come to our country and yeah. say... And that then the, that call the us anti-Scottish? Call, call the majority of Scots mm-hmm. who voted to remain in the UK anti-Scottish. Yeah, it's absolutely it's sickening. It really is. Yeah, that's quite disgraceful. I'm sure she's used the term British nationalist in the, in the past also. That's just uh, uh, unthinking regurgitation of very, very uh, extreme nationalist polemic. That's all it is. Disgraceful for a civil servant, public servant. Absolutely appalling. It really is uh, terrible and uh, something that needs to be considered to these people. It's like get out your bubble or something yep. somehow and see uh, what the real Scotland's about. It's not some kind of nationalist utopia or ut- utopia in waiting. There are real people around and and who don't share your views. And that's what's good about any country is that people, you know, we have a mix of opinions and we have different types of people, people from the islands, people from the north, people from the south central board. Oh, it's all, it's all a mix. It's not one homogenous thing it really is it's not terrible so anyway we'll be back in a second to discuss some disillusioned nationalists not too happy with our nicola uh thanks for being with us again uh we uh, would like you to like control if you uh, please that like button if you like and even better if you can subscribe your not far off 2,000 subscribers, which is really great. You can get all alerts and all kinds of stuff on YouTube if you do that. Um, I better get this video up, actually. Yesterday, there was an interesting video by a lady who was outside the um, inquiry. Her name was Elaine Johnson. Her brother had died of COVID in February 2021. Hi. I just wanted to say that all during lockdown, we watched those podium. And I kept thinking, thank God I'm not in England. Thank God we've got her here telling the truth. And I'm absolutely ashamed and devastated 
to hear what she's doing now. Can't believe it because I really sat there with all my family saying, my God, thank God we're not in there with those idiots. And here we've got one ourselves. That's what I've got to say. Well, I think this is actually quite instructive because um, I think it shows a lot of the mentality of how people like Sturgeon can thrive in uh, Scotland. Of course, we feel sympathy for um, Mrs. Johnson's loss, um, but I can't th help thinking, what did you expect? When yep. you willingly embrace people like uh, Sturgeon, Salmon and Yusuf, and who sell the lie that Scots are better than English, is it any surprise that they're also incompetent? They, they use that lie to hide their incompetence. That is the point. They, if they were competent, they wouldn't need to do that. Um, so we said before, the other part of it is, it, it, it's, it's not that these people operate in a vacuum. They are. They see how society works. That's what's clever about them. They're like a, I don't know, con men or stuff like that. They see the mark. They go, this is how I can get power and money. And you see that with the gravy train people more than anything else because it's so obvious they don't actually believe in independence they just believe in getting us getting money and you know in some tv time and all that type of stuff they're not really you know committed nationalists i mean how many actually are they, 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 anyway so it's so easy for you know cynical and lazy politicians opportunists almost to take advantage of scott's grievances yeah. So it appears to me one minute you're talking, you've got a grievance about you know, uh, TV commentators saying England instead of Scotland on the TV, and the next minute you're supporting Nicola Sturgeon. Now that's what that's the path, right? Yeah. Isn't it? It's yeah. basically that's the path. They come and say to you, "Here's the, here's you know you upset about this thing." Well, okay, well here's my I can solve this. But the only way they solve it is not by any competence. They solve it by giving you feeding you more grievance. They say, Oh, did you see the other one? Did you see the other one? And then it gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So I think until Scots um realise it's their own insecurities that created Sturgeon, um, that their own nationalism is the cause of and the root of the root cause of their ills, they'll continue to vote for the next charlatan and the next one and the next one and the next one. Yeah. Can't they see it? That's the yeah. thing, David. Can't how yeah. can they not see it? It's so obvious to us. Exactly. I mean, to me, the, the the main problem with Scottish nationalism is it's not really based on a historic sense of grievance, as it was in Ireland, for example, uh, where they had centuries of conflict, if you like, and then an almost a, a, a reluctant. Uh, uh, coming together in the 19th century, a terrible event with, with the, the famine, then the uprising and the killings and all the rest of it. So you had genuine historical sense of, of deep, deep, deep hurt there. In Scotland, it's just a vague, generic sense of disquiet with Westminster and the way things are. So people say, well, you know, I'm not really all that thrilled with uh, the, 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 con the Conservative government in Westminster. So I know, let's break the whole country apart. That's a good idea, isn't it? Because, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? I, know, that's, I mean, that's the thing. It just seems yeah. it goes from one minor grievance into yeah. into a big grievance. And perhaps this is how the... Um, the I don't want to make too many Nazi comparisons, but this is perhaps how it worked with the Nazis. Well, come and say, well, you know, here's the... The Jews are doing this, you know. They're stealing yeah. all the money, they're causing, okay. they're causing trouble, all this type of stuff. Yes. And then, you know, it's like, the, what, the, was there any grievance? Did your average German even know any Jews, for example? I mean, in a similar way, that do the average? Uh, I mean, how many, how much mingling do, does the average Scot do it with the English? That, well? That's very true. I mean, and even if you look at that, I mean, if you take the comparison in terms of historical comparison, Germany had this sense again of. Uh, of being cheated out as a result of the Treaty of Versailles after oh, the yes. mm -hmm. war. They thought that they'd been hard done by another festering sense of, of deep, deep resentment. And then, of course, the 1930s brought the Great Depression. You would know yes. that the rate of inflation where Germans were literally taking a wheelbarrow full of cash down to the shop to buy a loaf of bread. So th that, those, if you like, were the, the, the contextual settings of the the, 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 the the rise of Nazism. There's nothing like that in Scotland. Nobody, no. We haven't got 10,000% per inflation here. We haven't been uh, defeated and accumulated in the world war. Nothing like that's happened. So the Scottish nationalist movement is built on sand. There's nothing there at all. Nothing there that you could really say, this is what's going to get us over. Like, yeah, but just... then how, why does it so, why is it so, you know, why is it so appealing to people? I, my, my, honestly, right? 
Yeah, my, 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 I have a theory here, which is that Scotland since the 50s has considered itself a socialist country. It thinks that Scottish people think ah, we are not like those privileged English people. We all go to Eton and Oxford or Cambridge and uh, they, they're born with silver spoons. Armaments. We are a caring people. We believe in giving a, a fair deal to the working man and all this stuff. And we believe this for 55 years. Or six well, central years. belt, certainly. I mean, when you get out to the countryside, Scotland is... Uh, a very conservative country. That's true. There are areas of Scotland, vast areas of Scotland, like the whole of the south and the whole of like Perth, are all over Aberdeenshire, Stirlingshire also, very, tiny bits of Glasgow, which are very conservative, some bits of Ayrshire, but there is an awful lot of Scotland which isn't. And the numbers are probably with the, the if you like, the socialists. And in every election since 1955, Scotland has returned at least 40 either Labour MPs or SNP MPs or jointly Labour stroke SNP MPs at every single one. And there have only been between 57 and 73 seats in Scotland at that time. So there has been, a, if you like, a plurality, if you like, of votes going that way. That's just the way it happens these days. And that, I think, is why when the Labour Party became unpopular after the Second Iraq War, the situation was ripe for um, the, the SNP to come in, particularly after the Conservatives and Labour politicians stood together on the Better Together campaign. And if you remember, that was 2014. Yes. The next year, there was a complete rejection of Labour. Uh, and the, the very same people who had been voting Labour, which was up at 42 seats, the SNP was at about four seats. It went like that the next election. Complete reverse. Yeah. So that's what happened. And it's kind of hung on ever since. Now we've seen the, the, uh, the outcome of voting for these incompetent charlatans and people are starting to go back. And I'm hearing all the time people saying, yeah, well, I've, I, I believed in independence, but ugh, there's no point now, so I'll just vote Labour again. And well, I think, that's, yeah, you know, well, of course, that's um, good. But, I mean, if, if say, Labour fails and uh, comes back, uh, the SNP could come back. And this is the thing, because they're still looking for the messiah, Somehow, I think that is what the looking for the Messiah. We yeah. are poor, downtrodden people, so we need a Messiah to save us. Now, perhaps we're all a bit like that. Um, maybe Scotland so much more, but uh, nonetheless, not Scotland's nationalist fantasy has led us down a dead end, and I believe it's time for Scotland to grow up. Next yeah. up, we're going to have a quick short segment, David, on the next general election. Uh, so we'll be back in a second. If you have anything to say, please do do it in the chat. The chat is going crazy tonight. I'm trying to stop people. Very good, David. Tell us a little bit more what's going on in election time. Happily, happily, happily. Okay, this week we've seen an awful lot yet more turmoil in the UK Conservative Party. Keep it brief, it culminated last night in the resignation of ex cabinet minister Simon Clark whose valedictory statement said Sunak has gone from asset to anchor. That's anchor, incidentally, guys. In case <laughs> right, okay. um, no um, W in that, no? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And under his leadership, said uh, Clark, the party faces electoral massacre. Well, no, does that, that is, mean they're going to replace him? Because there is a movement in, in the UK Conservative Party to ditch Sunak, which would, of course, mean the fourth uh, premier of this, uh, of this particular term. Totally unheard of. Will it happen? I don't think so quite simply because no plausible party leader would want to become uh, prime and, and conservative party leader ahead, only a few months ahead of a general election, oh, which crazy. the party is almost certain to lose. It's not going to happen. And in any event, there are loads of realistic candidates to replace him. You know, you've got Penny, Morton, Bad enough, Hunt, even Braverman. But why would they do it? It's not going to happen. They're 20 points behind the Labour. Let's Nothing. best to let him lose. Let's let Sunak lose. That's what they'll do. So I don't think that'll happen. Now, what will, what will the impact be of this likely Conservative implosion at the next election and Labour revival, what will the impact be in the Scottish political landscape? Well, unfortunately, this week saw yet another uh, of a very uh, lengthy and depressing series of uh, disappointing, uh, if you like, contributions from Professor Sir John Curtis, who said, he was asked, when, uh, when asked, does Labour need uh, uh, a renewal in Scotland to win a majority? His answer was, do you have the video there, Benny Chance? Yeah, I do have video. Just video. Okay. They used to say, John, that, that the path to Downing Street, since we've got Kezia with us, the path to Downing Street for Labour runs through the Scottish constituencies. Is that still the case? Do they still need a renewal uh, of Scottish Labour to command a majority? Not necessarily. Um, I mean, today's 27 point lead in the in in, in uh, UGAF's poll. Forget it. I mean, uh, the Labour Party doesn't need a single extra seat in Scotland to get a very substantial majority, uh, given those kinds of figures. Um, if you take the, I believe if you take the average of the opinion polls at around 19 points, 
that would be enough to deliver a Labour majority uh, simply within England and Wales. Of course, what the Labour Party is concerned about is that maybe their lead in the opinion polls will be narrower by the time of the election and that therefore picking up some seats in Scotland will otherwise ease a path that might, in the absence of those seats, result in a minority Labour administration rather than a majority one. But the truth is, if Labour retain the kind of poll lead they have had ever since the demise of Liz Truss, the former Prime Minister, back in October 2022, and then what happens in Scotland will end up proving to be irrelevant. Hmm, okay. Right. Uh, so, I, didn't, I didn't watch the whole of that before. It's, I mean, it's quite, actually, it's shocking, isn't it? I think it's shocking. To, to me, that is the, the most lazy non-analysis you'll ever see. What Curtis is saying there is, well, of course, if Labour is a big enough league nationwide, then they won't need votes in Scotland. In other words, John, you mean the English and Welsh electorate combined is bigger than the Scottish electorate with 10 times the population? Wow, who would have thought that? I mean, well, I mean that's, that's not analysis. That's just arithmetic. So what he's saying there is, right, oh, well, of course, if they're big enough, lead the win. Great. But what he doesn't do in any way is give it any meaningful analysis or assessment. So he doesn't say, for example, the fact that I've uh, said... Um, stated repeatedly, which is that not once in his history has Labour won a UK general election without also winning a majority of the seats in Scotland. Now, Labour is almost certainly going to win the UK general election. Now, what are people in Scotland supposed to take from that? Oh, I know, I'll just vote SNP. Why? So that you can yet again say, oh, we don't get the government we vote for. That's because you don't vote for a government. You effectively abstain by voting SNP. Yes, that's the correct. only thing you do by, by, by voting SNP is what you've achieved the last three times, and that's make it far more likely that the Conservatives will somehow hold on. And in any event, what he could have said, have said additionally is he could have said, well, of course, Scottish votes have been directly uh, determining in the outcome of four elections since yes. the second, not one, which is what the SNP keep lying, 1964, 1974, both elections, and even in 2017, Scottish votes directly determined the outcome of those elections. So this is this is real pseudo slanted non-analysis from Curtis, very disappointing, at least for once. He didn't say, well, of course, Brexit's made Scottish independence inevitable. Yes, so I know. It seems that more and more he's revealed himself as national lean, nationalist leaning because he knows that any of his statements will be taken and used by nationalists as, as you know, in the front page of the National or, or, or wherever news is used as their arguments. But I just, I, I just uh, don't get the selfishness of it all. I mean, it, basically the idea is, okay, so we'll leave it to the people in England and Wales to change the government and we'll sit here, you know, indie wanking basically and yeah. thinking about independence a uh, dream of independence it's like come on absolutely know, participants in the society you don't you know you want to if you want to change the government be actively doing that and you've got these people with their msps and so on and they're all saying like vote snp to keep the labor honest it's like well you know how you keep labor honest vote labor and do it from the inside you absolutely, know what I mean? right. it's absolutely nonsense. Week. we want to be able to uh impact and uh affect and influence the labor government well i've got an idea how to do that Elect a Labour MP. You yes. Absolute, <laughs> absolute nonsense. It really is nonsense. Yeah. And, I mean, we could go on about this for a while, but it's going to be Mary's section. So, uh, before that, uh, please do donate to the show. If you can, you can do a super thanks, or a, a super sticker, which is a wee button down at the bottom of YouTube, um, or you can go to our website, and we have a donation page, which I actually have here. It's not very exciting, but it's to just go to this one here, donate to the majority, click that link that's in there, and that will take you to our donation page for 2024. Everything you donate is appreciated. helps to go to run the show and to keep us going. It takes quite a bit of effort to keep all this uh, going here. Now, Mary's going to talk about some crazy stuff in one week in Scotland in a second. The question here really is how much crazy stuff can you fit into, you know, 10 minutes, Mary? Well, I, I'm not sure about that, but it's how much crazy stuff is there? It's unlimited is it the really answer is. to that. But I'm limited by time, so I will just try to... Uh, run through a few of the things that have come up this week. This is the second of my series, another crazy week in Scottish <laughs> politics. I did one a couple you. of months ago, and I think it's going to become a regular gig if anybody, if everybody likes oh, it. Um, so here are just a few of the batshit crazy policies that have prompted <laughs> headlines this week. I've got four headlines, so I'll run through them fairly quickly. 
First up, Mark, if you could do the honors. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, that's that one there. This one is about a latte tax. That's what it's being <laughs> called. Slater's plans for charge on single use cups dismissed by business. She's at it again, guys. Why are they still letting her play at developing policies <laughs> and making legislation? It's absolutely Take crazy. the toys off her, for God's sake. <laughs> um, so she is, of course, our circular economy miss minister, which I think is an app name because she's always going around in circles. Um, <laughs> Very good, Lorna Slater is planning to put a charge on single-use coffee cups and what is being called the latte tax. Okay, so the Scottish government wants to do more to cut down on waste, but this is going to be an absolute rerun of the ill fated Number one thing you could do to cut down on waste is bin her. Yep. I mean, that's <laughs> that total waste of money. I mean, how much waste was that? Hundreds of millions? It was. I know. So the ill-fated deposit return scheme, which was also designed to cut down in waste, and it was resisted, as we all know, by businesses. So this new levy for disposable drinks cups would hit small drink suppliers who have already been hit badly enough, and it will impact everyone who attends any events, such as music concerts and festivals, winter markets, all-day conventions, conferences, and other business events. I can't, I can't bodies, believe busy, that... Busy, busy, busy bodies, you know. Okay. Yeah, Don't she you should say, get an alternative job as a traffic warden or something. Really? I mean, I, oh, you know, no. Oh, you know, I would like not that. want to be out in the roads if she was the traffic warden. But, <laughs> you know? I mean, what, what happened to, you know, the advice, once bitten, twice shy? Quite. She's well, back on it, it that, no, again. It, well, obviously, it was an XL bully dog in that yeah, case. Bit, yeah, God. <laughs> anyway, David, what do you think about this? <laughs> exactly as you say. Can you imagine anybody being asked to, uh, to mastermind a scheme in Scotland, post a pandemic, might I add, which involves taking the same cup in to hand to somebody else to use and to fill up and give back to you. Really, that's a good idea, is it, guys? I thought we were learning lessons from the that's pandemic. Good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. You can't yeah, do that. I thought of that. Exactly. You remember how quickly all that stuff was scrapped? Remember, there was a, a previous attempt to say, oh, you get 30p off if you bring your own cup back. That went straight out the window when the pandemic happened. So, you know, really, are we going to do that again? No, it's just, it's, it's yet more whack a mole stuff that we see. How, what have we got an issue with? Uh, recycling, right? I know, boom, let's batter this down. Let's only use, uh, never use cups once, and then eight other things spring up. Classic, myopic, green, pseudo-green policy in Scotland. Cups is the biggest dimwit in Parliament. Ridiculous. And who cares about business? Scotland doesn't need businesses. Right, exactly. Let's just hammer Look. them, punish them for having a business. Exactly. Okay, so talking about punishing them for having a business, uh, next up is the health tax surcharge on large grocers so here's the headline health tax will punish shoppers retailers claim the scottish government has proposed reintroducing a public health supplement that required larger retailers to pay more if they sold alcohol and tobacco apparently this raised about 100 million pounds over three years before it was scrapped in 2015 nobody seems to be asking why was it scrapped <laughs> uh, so this proposal was not mentioned by shona robinson during her budget address to MSPs last month, but it was referenced in a written budget document which said that they were committed to exploring the reintroduction of a non-domestic rates public health supplement for large retailers in advance of the next budget. So we're talking about this coming up pretty soon. The Scottish... Why? I'm sorry, why? It's, it's somehow for health or something like that? Yep. Yep. They just it want makes to, you healthier they're, they're, if you don't listen, go to... they're a... looking for someone to tax. It looks, it, oh yeah, it, looks, it makes you healthier if you don't go to ASDA. Or Tesco's, or any of, or but Aldi, you go, or we whatever. We can go and buy the same stuff in. Oh yeah, if you go to a smaller place, yeah, that's that doesn't sell alcohol and, of course and tobacco. It's less, less convenient, of course. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I guess most shops will do. You know, I mean, what a joke, honestly. It's a desperate attempt to try and do another tax, and They're the Scottish ta tax tax end it moves. Yep. When or it doesn't move. move. Yeah. Well, actually, you Whether know, think of it. I mean, you know, when I was young, I used to say, yeah, you know, those politicians, though, they'll end up taxing the air we breathe. Oh, and yeah. that's, that's what they did with the carbon tax. <laughs> right. And the Greens. That's exactly responsible. What that's it. Right. That's exactly what it is. So, well, remember, remember the Beatles song, Tax Man, you know, if, yeah, if, right, you, know, yeah, if you take a walk, I'll tax your feet. Just yeah, wait till I give yeah. you a 10 toe tax. That will happen next, guys. I guarantee it. Yeah. Well, right. the Scottish Retail Consortium said that the proposal smacks of incoherent. Policy making. Well, they know about smack, I suppose. Yes, smack. <laughs> Incoherent policy making. <laughs> I think that bit sums it up. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> um, in real yeah, the retail consortium wouldn't say that. Oh, yes, I understand what you're saying. Smacks okay. of incoherent policy well, making. All right. Um, okay. That. I mean, that sums up Scottish politics, incoherent policy making. No, what sums up Scottish politics is smack and incoherent <laughs> <Yeah>. policy. <laughs> <laughs> both at the same time in many cases, it appears. <laughs> 
Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> right, moving on. Um, headline number three. Have you got that for right, us, Mark? What, was that? What's that? what batshit that crazy the, thing is that? That is the landlords <laughs> blaming politicians and rent policies. Uh-huh, uh, you got that one? Yeah, yeah, okay, so it says, Scott Gov rent rise curbs blamed for forcing landlords out. Uh-huh. Yep. So Scotland, did you know that Scotland has become the only part of Great Britain where sales of properties by landlords has gone up? Well, is that so any surprise, really? We saw this coming a year ago. Um, landlords are selling up. So research from Hamptons, the estate agents found in a December survey that landlords are selling up because of rent controls. And listen to this, politicians' attitudes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's isn't that crazy? That well, landlords are selling up because the politicians are so against them. It's true. And that's we know exactly who that is, Ross Greer. Yeah, and indeed. Patrick Harvey. Oh, and, well, it's no surprise, yeah, you know, as you say. And the Greens. A hostile environment, right, when you say they want to close all landlords down. Yep. And, they're, and, they're, and they're, they're pulling the, the tail of the cat that is the Scottish government. Right. That's what okay. happens. Um, homes are being sold uh, by a land. Homes being sold by a landlord in Scotland has reached a record high. 56% of respondents say they are planning to reduce the number of their properties. In the last year, nearly 22,000 homes might have been lost, which is about 6.4% wow, in like one year. There are 340,000 rental properties in Scotland. So that's 22,000 properties off the rental market. Exactly. We're in the middle of a housing crisis. Edinburgh, Glasgow and Argyll have announced a uh, housing emergencies and this is what's going on in scotland when landlords were asked how they will go about withdrawing their properties from the market for 58 percent of properties the landlord said they would serve notice to evict their 10 tenants there right. so there you go well it's always said there is, uh, stuart said is butte house for sale yes well we'd hope that one day it may be and the whole scottish parliament could be turned into student accommodation very good idea there we go. Or perhaps homes for the homeless or just raised to the ground. Um, I don't so, know. Whatever. Okay, last headline, oh, guys. Okay. You, you ready? The craziness continues. Yeah, a l- little bit more craziness to go. I, th- <laughs> right, I think it has okay. to be told. Have you got that one, Mark, about the buses? Yeah, oh, yes, I do, actually. Right, so the headline is Fears for Future of Buses as £500 million of flagship fund stalls. Okay, so the Scottish government's flagship £500 million plan was supposed to improve public transport, <laughs> increase passenger numbers, and ban older cars from city centres. Oh, well, I think was the LEZ, the, wasn't it? They've succeeded with the third one with the ULEZ. Um, but how about improving public transport and increasing no, passenger it, numbers? Plan. Well, it ha- well, okay. the whole plan has been plunged into chaos. They have spent under £27 million of the £500 million that they were supposed to use. So they've spent 5%. Since the fund was set up, the number of passenger journeys on local bus services in Scotland has actually fallen by 25%. And that includes the free, the free kids ones as well. I suppose so. Yeah. So it's further revealed that the Scottish government budget for supporting bus services has been slashed by nearly half over two years from ninety nine million pounds in twenty two twenty three. Yeah, I saw some to fifty five million. I saw some today that we're going to stop doing the electric buses in some of yeah, the afford to buy. Yeah, yeah. And I think those electric buses are great because they're nice and quiet. Uh, I want to go. Uh, I've not been on one yet, but I really want to because remember the old days used to sit in the back of the diesel bus and it would make such a noise. And you're like, oh, you know, I'm wanting future. I'm wanting future. Please give me these electric buses. <laughs> anyway, quite often, the they're flying buses. Silent. They're very nice, but yeah, they're still freezing cold and filthy. But you know, oh, make well, a lot of noise. That. Okay, Mary, well, the Scottish it's... government are trying to get everybody off the roads, yeah. and then. Yeah. The you know the bus services are being cut and the number of people on the buses. So I don't know. I think we're all supposed to stay home with our fifteen minute, what is it, fifteen minute villages or or cities or something like that. Yes. Yeah, we're not supposed to travel. Yes, and Evelyn says here. I thought we'd mention the um, field sailings to Europe from Scotland. Yes. Well, there's only so much time. And in, in, in the day. Uh, listen, we could be doing this every <laughs> every night of the week. Yes, we, I mean, you could, you could actually, that's the thing. Right, okay, uh, electric buses bursting into flames. Yes, it does happen from time to time. It happened twice last week in I London. I like that elect, 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 what's it called? I like that electrical goodness. All right, okay, <laughs> things you can do to support the show. You can make a donation to the majority's 2024 crowdfunder. Maybe puts a wee banner up. Go to majority... Uh, website and click the donate button which is up the top there you can buy a t-shirt or a mug I'm going to get one of those uh, you've my favourite Zoomer ones and you can see how it is, is modelled in a real person 
right? And uh, you can subscribe or like it the show. And of course, please tell your friends about us. That's how it's grown. We're growing, growing a lot um, over the past uh, six months, anyways, particularly because people have been talking about it. And you can do all of the above, which makes us feel worthwhile. <laughs> underlined exclamation mark. All yeah. right, coming up. It's the moment you have all been waiting for. Did someone actually write dissolve the union there. Oh Jesus! They still, they're still there. They're still out there. Right. Okay. Um, coming up, it's the moment you have all been waiting for. It is the highlight of the week. It is Zoomer of the Week. Okay, so my Zoomer of the Week is the time to use and, and take unions to any partisan. Now, it's you and yours. You might remember that uh, David. Um, the Kenny was David's choice last week. Last week it was, yes. When David uh, said that Kenny had a particularly tiresome habit of talking up nationalism and seeking to breathe, breathe new life into the flagging independence movement. Well, and he's at it again. Now, let me see. We'll find his article here. Right. Okay. So, um, in, in the Times, in an article titled... Um, uh, how Humza Yusuf misread the mindset of Scottish voters. Um, he hails Humza Yusuf's belated realization that kicking out the Tories is the electorate's priority, and uh, says it's a welcome change of attitude to, from the party towards Labour. Well, welcome to the party, pal. I think we said that last week. I mean, how long have you been going on about this this thing? That's, I mean, ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, the cheek to say in the article, for a while the party believed that political gravity did not apply to it. So when the inevitable fall began, it was ill-equipped to deal with it. The SNP began to realise that it was adrift and out of touch. The result was it panicked. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's very strange because I've never seen an article from Kenny in the Times saying that the SNP was going to experience an inevitable fall. Once. I even checked in Google. And um, so now we're supposed to think that he somehow saw this coming after no evidence whatsoever. And, um, and then the main art, but the main thrust of the article was all about how he's really, really great that Hamza has finally realised that Labour is going to win and that Hamza now wants to work with him. And he ends it with this amazing line. I can't go over this, actually. The SNP is now where it needs to be, but by God, it was a struggle getting there. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, What? <laughs> I just don't understand why a person who's supposedly a pro-UK commentator who said in uh, in the comments maybe to the article you mentioned uh, last week uh, that he would vote no, he voted no and would vote no again. I do not understand why he would say such a thing. Why why he's so happy that the SNP is in a good position. Why he even thinks that Hamza Yousaf is interesting and why he would not really say that this is the daftest thing you've ever heard because... <laughs> um, Humza, why would you say Hamza Yousaf is an idiot? Yeah. Because he led a leading a party that's called Labour, Red Tories for how long? I yeah. don't know. And until uh, until uh, and until a few weeks ago, yeah, ten years. Mm -hmm. And until a few weeks ago, said Labour and the Tories were indistinguishable. Yep. And yep. said they would vote against Labour budgets even if they didn't get set if they didn't get a second referendum. <laughs> so you might say, okay, well, is this some why is this some commentator? You know, who is this guy? Yes. Right, but the thing is, this is the Times. This is one of the major newspapers in the country. It's read by people, of course, internationally, but it's read by you know people, policymakers, decision makers, and so on. Yep. And it should be, first of all, it should be ahead of the news, not behind the news. It shouldn't be pandering and appeasing this minority hobby that um, Scotland has of. In fact, it's a minority in the UK as well. So it's like it's a UK newspaper. Shouldn't be pandering to this nonsense, right. and it shouldn't be. It should be predicting and questioning why nationalism is falling and why why it happened. The stuff that we're doing every week. That's that's what it should be exactly doing. Right. I think not it doesn't exist. So anyway, it's cheerily cheerily different. Haven't person. they noticed that he's been in the same thing all these years? I don't know. It's absolutely maybe, mental. Yeah, maybe they don't read the Scottish section. <laughs> If he said today he's a nationalist who pretends he isn't, how does he get away with it? It's true. Know, it's, 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 very, it's very, cool. very weird. And it's like, wake up, you know, move yeah. on. You know, it's over already. And we need to we need to yeah. these newspapers to support. It's like the national. So reading the national. I mean, come on. <laughs> anyway. All right. That was mine. Rant over. Moving on. It is David's turn. Uh, 
Hey, who have you got for us, David? This week, my nomination for Zoom of the Week is Westminster SNP leader Stephen Flynn, no stranger to the show. I hear you think and say you're right. Since ousting Ian Blackford as leader, Flynn has asked a series of frank third questions during PMQs, and today was no exception. Uh, I don't know if you've got the video there, Mark, but this was Flynn's question. Yeah, I've got the video. Last night, as Tory MPs were once again fighting amongst themselves, the public were sat at home watching John Irvin of ITV News report on footage from Gaza of an unarmed Palestinian man walking under a white flag, being shot and killed by the IDF. Prime Minister, such an act constitutes a war crime, does it not? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that what you want to stop it there? By all means, I'll go on and tell you what he says next. It's okay. Oh, does um, he go on? Does he go on? Does he talk more? more? Absolutely consistent okay. that international humanitarian law should be respected and civilians uh, will be should be protected. I've made that point expressly to Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Foreign Secretary is in the region this week making exactly the same point. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom to rise to that dispatch box and tell the people of these isles and elsewhere that shooting an unarmed man walking under a white flag is a war crime. Now, now in recent weeks, this House has acted with urgency and intent following an ITV drama. The question is, will this House now show the same urgency and intent following this ITV news report? And finally, right. back a ceasefire yeah, no, no, in Gaza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, OK. So what he's saying there is, oh, some poor guy was shot, obviously shouldn't have been, he was holding a, a white flag in Gaza. Yeah, it's, 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 and he brings into yeah. that uh, the post office scandal and the jailing of innocent people and the eventual suicide of some people whose lives are ruined. In the course of one question and the follow-up, he politicises both the death of a, 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 a civilian and the jailing and the, the lives being torn apart of hundreds of employees. What's that if it's not politicising? That is just the most gutter level politics you'll ever see. And all just to say, you should be asking for a ceasefire. Well, I'll tell you what you're not doing here, Mr. Party Leader at Westminster. You're not stepping out and saying, of course, if Hamas was to release all the hostages in Israel, then that would take away the one stumbling block for us for, from a sustainable ceasefire. So to me, that I think that is the most appalling question he's ever asked. Quite uh, joyfully saying, OK, here's somebody we can utilise here. Oh, a dead man. Fantastic. Let's use that. Oh, yeah, we people who went to jail unjustly. Brilliant. Let's shove that in. I think that's appalling. I think this is exactly the type of level of politics we see under the SNP, and I deplore it. I think it's disgusting, and I condemn it outright. And that is why he is my nomination for mm. Zoom of the Week. Yeah, it's definitely a difficult situation. I watched the video last night, and the problem with these things is um, it's just impossible to know what's actually what's actually going on yeah um yeah. there's no I mean, even if it's videos right there you don't know who who fired the shot who you shot don't know guy, what yeah. the situation was that led, that led up to be before that you might say just you have to just absolutely never come back here again for example or else we'll consider you a terrorist and we'll shoot you and you know to put your i mean it's a terrible situation who know but you don't know is it a, 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 but then elevating is it a war crime is it this i mean it's like well is it a competition to see who can commit the most atrocities i don't think that's what it's about really what it's about is you know Israel trying to um, uh, defend itself from future Hamas attacks and right. in doing so that's going to cause a lot of damage of course in in Palestine I'm not saying they brought it upon themselves um, but the Hamas leadership certainly brought it upon the people of Palestine and of course their sympathy it goes with them um, uh, be, if, if, if they are not with Hamas yeah. Um, unfortunately, so many of them are. Anyway, it's a quite a. Uh, it's just that it won't it be so great when they get up, they don't they're not in third place anymore and they've relegated to the back benches. Yeah. They don't get these ridiculous questions thudded up and. Uh, yeah, it's just absolutely. I mean, that will be absolutely perfect. Right, good one there. Moving on, it's going to be Mary. Uh, okay. Right, as you could see, we've run over a few minutes, but we'll be you'll be we'll be done soon. Right, you know? I'll try but, and get... can, but Mary's, every, of course, we have to wait for Mary's is always <laughs> the best, isn't it? Well, maybe not this week. I I, <laughs> I have to give you guys a chance sometimes. Oh, really? <laughs> However, my Zoomer of the week this week is Humza Yusuf. 
who has taken too long to finally agree to banning XL bully dogs in Scotland. Now, oh. England and the rest of the UK introduced a ban months ago and it will come into effect on February 1st, so just a few days away, and it will be a criminal offence to own an XL bully dog in England and Wales without a certificate. Uh, and we tried to warn Hooms a month ago. If you remember, I had a whole segment on it uh, just within the last couple of months, yep. um, I think back in November, and warned that these dogs will attack in Scotland. Uh, but just a few short weeks ago, on January 5th, it was reported in the National, so it must be true. Oh, Right. Okay. So Humza said in all his wisdom, have you got that, Mark? Oh, 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 okay, yes. Which one's this? The XL Bully Dog ban yeah. probably not, not required, required that in that Scotland. Been, that one's been up already. Oh, did you put it up already? Yeah, that one's been up okay, already. so Humza said that the, the, the Bully Dog ban would not be required in Scotland. But here we have on Sky News today, if you could put oh, that one oh, up. Sky News, Sky, got it. Right, okay. On Sky News today, the news is that South Lanarkshire large bulldog type dog shot dead after two men attacked. So armed police have shot. Uh, armed police today have shot a dog dead after it attacked two men and went for an officer in Hamilton. One of the men is in hospital with serious injuries. Now Hamilton's just a few miles from where I am now, yeah. and we were actually in Hamilton today, weren't we, Mark? Yes, we were actually. And we're looking out for. We saw, did see a big dog. We did see a couple of big dogs, and we were like, Whoa, uh, we're watching "Yeah," it. and now we're a bit scared. But <laughs> Humza Yusuf seemed to think that Scottish bully dogs are better behaved than English bully dogs. Oh, yeah, of <laughs> that must have been his well, reasoning. They become Scottish when they cross the border. They become better <laughs> yes. behaved immediately. So that Scottish, is, uh... the Scottish ones wouldn't attack anyone. Mm. But lo and behold, mm. today in Hamilton we have had a quite serious attack. Um, the man is in hospital with serious injuries. Yeah, so says here, Grumpy Gets says the man's fighting for his life. I mean, that's a bad. That's, that's that, terrible. Who would want one of that those is things? Absolutely terrible. You know, chomping at your neck. I mean, really, or whatever, or whatever, any body part. Of course. Oh God, no. Those things are are. are Slabbering. Terrible. Anyway, a few days ago, Humza did do an about turn, and Scottish bully dogs will be banned in Scotland, but is it, it, inevitably it's going to be later than yeah. the rest of the UK. So how many more people will be attacked in the meantime? And why was Humza so quick to try to be different from England? If England had a lot of attacks and said these dogs are dangerous, then why did it take so much outcry for him to do the safe, sensible thing? Well, they didn't want to be seen as as being lap dogs, as it were, of <laughs> the Westminster um, uh, administration. <laughs> so they let uh, the, the, the bullies run free. Uh, bully dogs run free across um, Scottish moors and Hamilton. Uh, well, as the well. thinking in Scotland was actually Hums's thinking. What well, it, it said that it was basically because in Scotland we already had. Uh, laws that would take care of it. In Scotland, yep. what happens is um, that dogs are fine, if, but if a dog does attack someone or whatever, then they'll try to do something about it. So it's hey. after, after the fact, after your face has been mauled off, <laughs> yep. then they'll uh, say, oh, well, that so. particular dog is, not the dog breed, just that dog is dangerous. But the lessons will have been learned by that stage of the movie. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let us be of clear course, of course. Let's be clear about, about that. Yeah. Oh, look, it says here, mate, I have to decide. Yeah, you're deciding today, Mark. <laughs> oh, go on, Mark. The power is all mine. It's okay. I'll, I'll still make your tea, even if you <laughs> don't vote for me. The power is all mine. Right, okay, so we had Humza and the Dugs. No, I don't think that's the winner this uh, week. I think it's quite good. And no. when we had Stephen Flynn and uh, Stephen mm. Flynn, you know, Skeletor, mm -hmm. you know, standing up there. Um, talking about Gaza, when of course they should be actually talking about what's actually going on in Scotland. But let's say he is an MP, so he's allowed to make, they are allowed to talk about that. That's fair enough. Um, and mine was oh, Kenny Farson, but he has put it anyway. I just want to grump about him. That's the thing. So I think it has to go to Hamza and the Dogs. Really? Yes. Oh, I didn't expect to win this week, honestly. <laughs> yes. I thought it needed reporting, but I didn't actually expect to win. Um, well, it's just an on, I, I mean, I can, that's the word I've been using more and more as 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 the, as the weeks go on. It's just a total imbecile. Yes. And and it's it's just it's it's just like these are dangerous dogs. Okay, we'll wait a few weeks <laughs> <laughs> until until we well, decide. Well, no, he hadn't dangerous. any intention. I think there's been so much public outcry. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like no, our dogs are better behaved than those English dogs mm -hmm. down there. Even if the ones that come from England, they become new bullied Scots yeah. or something. Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So. That's true. New, new are Scots. Any specific Scottish breeds, Scottish terriers, right? But they're not so dangerous, are they? They're, they're, <laughs> they're quite wee. Terrier terrors. <laughs> Scottish terrors. Yeah. What did? Yeah. Well, anyway. 
Okay, well, good. A worthy Thanks, win Mark. there, Mary. Thank you. Um, anyway, okay, we're so happy to have you all uh, with us on the show every week um, on Scotland's number one politics chat. And we'll leave you with the thought of the week, which is always remember that the SNP is the symptom, not the disease. The disease is nationalism and its grievances that are amplified by toxic politicians like Nicola Sturgeon and the rest. Even if the SNP is defeated, we as a nation have to work to reduce these amplifications. Otherwise, the next charlatan that comes along, history will repeat itself. So thank you for your support. Uh, we will see you next week. Please do subscribe to the show and like and Majority Roadshow. Well, that'd be nice if we had a spare moment, but we are <laughs> super busy right now. We hope if you maybe I one would day love a road show. We, that would come, be great. we would come down to uh, um, Dolce & Gabbana um, there, but... Uh, Maybe maybe some other time. Well, we'll see how pos- popular the show gets. Please do uh, introduce it to other people. Uh, anyway, all right. So we will see you again next week on Scotland's Number One Politics Show. Good night from me. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, guys. Thanks very much for joining us. <laughs>